It's a grand old flag. It's a high flying flag. It's the emblem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good morning, you're listening to Bound for Glory on Sin. I'm your host, Ben Kazubi. You know, a huge week in footy. This is the best footy show on Sin, the only football show on Sin, and we're going to give all the news, reviews, and pretty much a straight run-through of what's happened this week. We got First, I should introduce the panel. What's up? I'm Jordan Whitty. Uh, Ethan Meldrum. Pralab Gupta. Damon Jackman. And last night... Eddie Ed Stadium, Carlton took on Geelong. Um, are Geelong the most laconic 7-4 and four side in history? Hey, quick bit of trivia. North Melbourne beat Geelong this year. That happened. Congratulations. Think, You're still on the bottom 10. <laughs> are we still like running on those fumes? And that? I think so. I think we've given up pretty much. Yeah, we beat Geelong. We can just shut the whole season down. That's it. Don't need to try anymore. Carlton last night, I think Carlton fans would be more pleased with the effort that was put in. You know, still the bunch of monochromatic morons that ring up talk back and you know call Sack for ratins. Sack ratin. Sack ratin. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they're just God, idiots. Big word. Total morons. Well, they probably Sexual won't word. understand it. You should have heard some of the guys uh, standing behind me and uh, Matt Big Marsden call. last night calling for Hampson to be subbed off and uh, Mick Malthouse to replace Ratton. Sub Hampson! <laughs> Suck Ratton! <laughs> Can we sub the coach? It's half time? the club! <laughs> No, but I just find it, you know, a massive overreaction. Yeah, you know, Ratton's not the problem. Uh, some of those players. What is are the out problem then, Ben? You tell them. What are the problems? You tell them what well, the problem is. Carlton have a massive injury list. I don't think any of those supporters, and you know, they counter with the argument. Oh, look at Collingwood. Look at West Coast. And you look at the players that were in last night to cater for those injuries, like um, Watson, Bootsma. These kids haven't had exposure at the top level like some of the kids at Collingwood have. Andrew like, Collins. Collins as well. Smart. That Greek trade is working out well. <laughs> Give it Joy- time. Give jo- it time. Joyce, jo- <laughs> Joyce will be giggling somewhere. Um, oh, that, that, no, Joyce. If you're listening, Joyce, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much, I think, deserved. <laughs> yeah, at this stage. Um, well, basically, Carlton last night, they they shot themselves in the foot. They kicked one goal eight in the last quarter. Geelong, Two goals, nine. Two nine, I think. Two nine. Mm. Well, they kicked a goal late. Was that the goal to Judd? Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, was. The one that was supposedly way, touched is looking decidedly old and slow. Chris Judd, he's no longer elite. He's, he, I think he's had his, his worst season for some time. That's that's pretty disappointing for Judd. I mean, he's a senior player, and you know, expect him to stand up in the absence of Murphy and whatnot. But you know, he's Dan, having to do? carry the load once again entirely. In a he is back to the days when we had uh, was it Nick Stevens? <laughs> <laughs> we had Nick Stevens and Judd. That was the Hall of Fame. Yeah, but you think with Carlton. They've been essentially a house of cards, and uh, they've collapsed because Andrew Carazzo is that strategically placed card you pull out and everything around it falls down. Um, he's been winning... Ha- he, in his first three games, he averaged something like over 30 touches. Uh, he ta- He's tagged. Um, he's able to win contested ball. He's very clean by foot, something that people often knocked him for, which has obviously changed because he's worked on it over the preseason. Once that... Ever since he's gone down in that first quarter against Essendon, Carlton's season's gone to hell. So you're saying that Andrew Carrazzo is Carlton's most important player? He is. Well, well I, th- I think he helps um, in terms of, uh, like with tags and stuff, like with Murphy at, Judd's going to get the best tag every week, and with Carrazzo there at least, if he was there, he would be um, sort of protecting Judd from these taggers and whatnot, so allowing him to get some space, but it's a bit hard now with Carrazzo out. Um, text in on 0427 767 767 if you agree with uh, the idea that uh, Carrazzo is Car- Carlton's best player. If you don't, Put up another name. We'll discuss it. Uh, what do we think of Bryce Gibbs' game last night? Uh, 11 disposals on the goal. Very efficient, but um, six contested disposals. Played on Steve Johnson. Kept him to 17 touches and goalless. What do you think? For me, I reckon he did his, uh, he did his role. Um, there was a few passages last night where he, he went in hard for the ball, and uh, which is what he's been panned for mostly. Um, you know, kept uh, Johnson to 17 possessions and one behind. Um, I, th- I think it was more just a case of doing his role as opposed to running free and uh, being creative? I think it's more a 
Yeah, yes, he did a very good job shutting down, but I'm still highly critical. He only had six pressure acts. And if he wants to that all important stat. <laughs> go up the next level, he's got to have more. But on last night, that's a stepping stone. And, you know, if Ratten can get that into him, yes, you keep doing your role. You let his confidence grow and he'll, you know, hopefully come good. I mean, Whoa. as I said before, if, you're not, if your team doesn't have confidence, everyone looks rubbish. We were having this discussion. <clears throat> excuse me. We were having this discussion before we came in today. Um, who, at the moment, is the more disappointing number one pick? Jack Watts or Bryce Gibbs? You have to go Bryce Gibbs. Bryce Gibbs. I, th- I think they're two different players, though. That's a thing. Like, it's, it's comparing apples to oranges. Because they're playing a similar role, they're playing in the defence, but with Jack Watts, he's playing more of a roaming, rebounding defender. Um, Gibbs has been playing that, but um, is, I think he's, is he's more Is that the role changed. you'd like to see Gibbs play, though, in Carlton's team? I don't, I don't think he's locked down defender. I think with the number one pick, with the talent Gibbs have, he, he, he should be playing in a rebounding, setting up role like Brennan Goddard, Luke Hodge in their early days, Brett Delidio. I think that's Gibbs' role, considering he didn't have any confidence, really, in the midfield, you could say. I think that's the role for him. Rather than locking down players, I don't think that's what you really should be getting from a number one pick. Yeah. Um, talk, sorry, Ben. Okay. Talking about... Um, Geelong, I suppose we haven't really covered them in any de- great detail, but um, how good can Stephen Motlop be? Because he kicked four goals no, last night. He, can ki- he kicked four goals last night, and um, I mean, and one for Carlton. Yeah, he's uh, he, <laughs> he just looks like an exceptional player. I mean, he's he's quick, skilled. He can kick goals and racks up touches at will. How good can he be? Where was he picked? Well, he's going to be better than his brother. I think that's for yeah, sure. He will. <laughs> he does a one percent as really well. Yes, but actually, on just one percent, how about that when he? Had a shot at goal. He he picked up the ball. He ran. He had a shot at goal. It missed everything. Oh, the and jo- and yeah. Joseph, yeah. you know, sort yeah. of fumbled a little. And he just sharked it and tackled him. Got the free kick. And he and he missed a shot on goal. But that's the second effort you want from in, uh, what is he first year player, second year player? No, he's, no, he's been in the system he's for been a about while three now. years, I think. So three. yeah, that's he had shoulder recos, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. He did yeah. injury issues. Yeah, like that's... all motlops do. <laughs> <laughs> I like him though. Very good young player for Geelong. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the thing is, cr- uh, criticisms were leveled, leveled at Ratten last night after the game, and just listening to Suck some him. of them, yeah, just oh, he has no ideas. Just off the top of my head, I can say he, obviously the obvious one, he put Gibbs to Johnson. Uh, he moved Judd out of the middle. He moved Betts and Walker up there, who had influence when Judd was getting tagged. So people seem to think he's inept. I think that's just a horrible, horrible observation to make. I mean. He's a, well, he's always been a minimal, minimalistic style, and he's admitted that you know not getting too hands on has probably improved his team. But if that works for them, why need a plan B? Plan A doesn't work because they're missing all that, you know, all those players due to injury. Well, I have one knock on Brett Ratton that, that in that he is too much of a supporter. I reckon when he stands on the boundary line, when he starts <laughs> celebrating goals, fist pumping on the boundary line, I think that's too much of a supporter. You look at club greats like um, Buckley, Hurd, Voss. They're very professional in the way they go about it. Team kicks Sorry, a goal. Sorry, Michael Voss. <laughs> <laughs> Is it club no, great? No, that's just off the top of my head. But um, Brad Ratton, you see him fist pumping on the boundary line. You see someone like Nathan Buckley, team kicks a goal. He's just very... D- no reaction. Just like that's what the team should be doing. I think Brad Ratton is too much of a supporter. Yeah, look, to me... He's a victim of his own expectations. He chose to say at the start of the year that Carlton will finish top four, and that was his decision to make, and he should be held accountable to those. But then words again, that he I said. don't think you really need to say that. I mean, going on last year, that we needed to take the next step, which was you know, consolidating a spot in the, in the top four this year. And you haven't, and I think mm. someone should be held accountable. Yeah, for or sure. maybe the players. Pay! Yeah. <laughs> You know, blame Andrew Carazzo for injuring his shoulder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> screw you, Andrew. Who was Carrazzo. the bloke who tackled him? Uh, it was Lonigan from Lonigan. Essendon. Okay, let's all blame Sam Lonigan. Well, that's for why he's been subbed the last couple of weeks. Sam Lonigan's fault for everything ever. <laughs> all right, all right. We're go to some ads, and we'll be back on Sin shortly. This is an FYI for in joke, so it's okay if you don't get it. Did you have an absolute hoot at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival and go and see all of your favourite comedians and some you've never heard of before? Or maybe you missed out and are sad that because the festival has ended, there will not be comedy again in Melbourne until next year. Well, you're wrong. Every time I click my fingers, a local comedian gets a job in retail so they can eat. As more comedy venues close due to lack of popularity, 
comedians have to walk kilometres and kilometres from their house to the tram stop to their venue just to get fresh laughs. Did you know that there are comedy rooms running in Melbourne every day of the week? When you mistakenly think comedy is just for the comedy festival, like a puppy is only for Christmas, another comedy room dies from laughter starvation. Do you want to be a better person and get more information? Listen to In Joke from 5pm Sundays for all of your comedy needs and for Melbourne comedy's sake. Get cereal! Slept in this week? This is what you missed. I think you'd have to send Delta Goodrum. What? No! She's got to be made for Eurovision. Oh. Yeah. No, yeah. she cannot sing. sing. She cannot sing. <laughs> well, she was born to try at least. <laughs> oh. 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 Look, he's very sociable. Most fighting fish are. And uh, I ate some tuna the other day. I looked at Pele and he looked at me. And I was like, oh. oh. <laughs> he knows. He knows. He knows. Get cereal. Get cereal. Get cereal. From 6 a.m. weekdays only on Sin. And welcome back to Bound for Glory on Sin, the only football show on this particular radio station, and therefore by Default. by law the best as well. <laughs> um, we're going to be the, there. Was some pretty huge news coming out of the AFL on Monday, and that was that the North Melbourne CEO uh, Eugene Arocca had resigned from his position effective immediately. Um, I don't think anyone saw it coming. I don't think anyone on the on the panel here saw it coming. No one had any inside information. No. No. Don't don't look at me. No. <laughs> It's, it's it's incredibly unfortunate, and um, you, a rocker did not appear at the press conference uh, due to what I can only assume was the emotion of the event. Um, Brayshaw read out a James, sorry, North Melbourne chairman James Brayshaw read out a prepared statement, um, and a rocker is no longer employed by the North Melbourne Football Club. Uh, people put put out a whole lot of rumours about what, it, why, um, you know, they put it down to a falling out between Brayshaw and a rocker. Uh, there was a feud between uh, North Melbourne's football operations manager Donald McDonald and a rocker. Even a boys' club, and then the somewhat ludicrous suggestion that we, the North Melbourne, not we, North Melbourne, um, chose between having Eugene Rocker or Donald McDonald, and then getting uh, Donald McDonald's incredibly talented son Luke, who is looking at the moment like he might be a top three draft choice next year. Um, at, for my personal opinion, I think um, Eugene Rocker is a major reason why North Melbourne are still North Melbourne. Um, without him, it's pretty possible we would be uh, a Gold Coast team with no soul. Um, that he's gone is a, a total shock and something that uh, I don't think a lot of North Melbourne people around the community thought could happen or would happen. Um, it's a it's a huge off-field blow to North, who already at the moment are looking like, you know, our season's pretty much shot and we can't make finals. Um, there's a quote that's been said previously, uh, it's better to live on your feet than die on your knees. Um, Eugene Rocker took that quote and applied it to North Melbourne in terms of the Gold Coast um, at, with help from James Brayshaw. Um, it's, it's a horrible reason. It's horrible that he's gone and... By the same token, North Melbourne now enters a new era of off-field leadership and that starts by finding a new CEO. Ladies and gentlemen. Well, <clears throat> he's gone because he he's obviously told someone the, th- the issues that he does have with North Melbourne. It's a bit like, you know, going to work and, you know, telling your wife or, you know, your neighbour or something, oh, this and this. And obviously that person has spoken to a uh, reporter from The Australian those things have become public, and you know it be, it's pretty obvious that those are his thoughts. Uh, then, in terms of the boys' club, board? Um, no, in terms of probably the criticisms, because I have heard that the board has been critical of the football operations, and the football operations have been critical of the board. Um, c- considering all these things, that his position did become untenable because the moment that you can't trust not only the people he's um, told these things, uh, he can't fulfil that p- uh, position anymore and therefore he had to go. Um, unfortunately, he's done a great job. He's not an exceptional job. If you look at the the, st- the list of things that he's done, he's taken North's membership from like 23,000 to almost 33,000. Um, the new facilities at Arden Street wouldn't be there without yep. Eugene Arocca. Um Yeah, it, I mean, he's, he's he pretty much saved this club from extinction, um, along with James Brasher, of course, who, you know, is the, the people's champion. Um, and uh, <laughs> you know it's 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 horrible that he's gone. I don't. It's so sad. We need a new CEO. Who who off the top of your heads, guys? Who should be the CEO? Mick Malthouse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian Cook it's... was one. Yeah. Uh, oh, that whole garbage with Cookie. Robbo um, quoting the icebergs menu in the Herald Sun. Have you heard the rumor that's uh, going around? No, what's the rumor? The rumor. Um, the guy who runs Adelaide at the moment, Trig. Yeah, the yeah. North is speaking to him. Oh God, please no. <laughs> no, I think they need someone from outside the North system entirely. Someone from a successful club who's had experience in working at a probably high-profile club. If they can poach that and pull that off, that'll be very beneficial for North. 
particularly get rid of that boys club mentality. I mean, I think Caroline Wilson wrote an article oh, this week. Okay. Here we go. Short. Do we want to cover that? Do we want to yes, cover yes, that? Yes, we want to cover it. Come on. Come what on, let's, let's do you think Bray Shaw should be the president of the North Melbourne Football Club? I yeah. think, of course. Absolutely. He yes. stood up mm-hmm. more on the... He, got asked the questions on the footy show. Anyone who said that he was shying away, you got a fair run. He was absolutely belted by Barrett and Lyon and Newman. Newman yeah. They absolutely belted him and he came out and he did what everyone asked him to do and he led. I, I've, I've got to ask the question, and I agree with everything you just said, Ben, that he's he, he leads this football club from the front. But I have to ask, what did he do to Caroline Wilson that has made her so hateful towards North Melbourne. What what how has he wronged her in the past? I think well Mark Brayshaw, his brother who's at North Melbourne at the moment, he was the CEO at Richmond for a bit. Yeah. And he didn't do a satisfactory job. So, you know, she's in with the Richmond click. So, you know, who knows, maybe it's that. Um her dad had issues with North Melbourne. You know, he famously got up when I think it was Schimmelbush who won, was it the Brownlow? And uh, yeah, I remember they, they thought like all KB deserved it, the Richmond mob, and you know, her dad stood up and just yelled and screamed in the um, ceremony. Uh, you know, they're just we don't know. Caroline Wilson, I have to say, she's intelligent enough to understand all these uh, concepts of you know club politics and club finance, but she can't present them. I'm sorry that. There was one quote in that article she wrote that was basically 800 words of knocking James Brayshaw saying, I despise you. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I think we need to move on to some more sim messages. We've got Don McClarty after this, which is a great interview, Melbourne present. So we'll go to some sim messages and he'll be back after that. Klingon pub, we hotpu air, which cup duck, mutai, which we sochnis. The Klingonian ambassador would like you to know that he has a live cat in his pants. And he enjoys it. Povam Wab Jab B It Ah We Lap Dach 90.7 Duck Che Li. The Klingonian ambassador would like to add that you should listen to the Sci Fi Hikers Guide to the Galaxy, available on Sin 90.7 from 3 pm until 4. That or. Okay, I'll be completely honest, I have no idea what this guy's saying. Kapwa! So my name's Josh. I run a dubstep and electro show on Monday nights. You should probably listen in uh, Mondays, 8 till 10 p.m. It's fun stuff. We have regular guests, new music all the time, and we're going to be talking to the latest, greatest in dubstep, electro, and now drum and bass. Tune in to Sins in the Electro Night from 8 to 10. And you're back on Sin, listening to Bound for Glory. We have an interview, exclusive interview, with the president of the Melbourne Football awesome Club, interview. Don McLarty. Thanks to our new... One of our new team members uh, on Sin, uh, Tom Bound for Glory, Tom Morris, and shout out the other one, Sophie Shaw. Sophie Both. Shaw and Ash Craven. Yeah, oh, Ash out. Craven as well, and they're doing a fantastic job, and here's the interview with Don. I'm here with Don McClarty, president of Melbourne Football Club. Don, thanks for joining us today on Bound for Glory. No problems at all, good to be here. Uh, the last three months must have flown by. Do you ever get a chance to sit back and reflect on uh, what's happened? Uh, not yet. <laughs> no, it's been very hectic three months. Uh, very full on around the club, but uh, we feel like we're making progress. And uh, it's been, but look, you probably know these four or five things happened to us. Some were in our control and some were out of our control. Um, but, uh, you know, it caused a lot of issues in and around the club, and uh, we had to keep focusing on the footy. But I think things are coming together now, and, you know, great win last weekend. So uh, that was great for everybody. You can't afford to dwell on things in the AFL, can you? How much further forward do you look at this stage in the middle of the season? We've been working on the uh, the 24-hour rule for about five weeks now, where after the game we've got 24 hours to mull it over, uh, think about it, and then we all try and move on club-wise to the next next challenge ahead. So um, that is a bit easier after a, a win than a loss, though. What have you learnt about the Melbourne Football Club in the time you've been president of the club? Uh, well, probably that there's a lot more passionate supporters than I thought, um, like people who really take it seriously. Uh, a lot of them made contact with me. I don't mean that all in a negative way. Uh, a lot of them have been really positive about the um, what's going on around the club, even though that we've you know lost, we were naught and nine at one stage. Over half of the responses I got were uh, were positive. So yeah, a lot of people take it really seriously and are heavily involved. It's great. Mm. Now, in the last few years, Melbourne's wiped its debt. Uh, on and off the, oh, off the field, um, and you've really powered forward off the field. What's holding your back? What's holding you back on the field? 
Uh, well, that's a tricky question. We, we, we have worked hard, very hard to get. I think everyone's always said that footy clubs, um, you need to be, you know, have a good administration, good structure first, and then um, on-field success will follow. So we really, we've been following um, that sort of line. Off the field, work very hard to get back to a good financial state, which everyone's aware of. Uh, we think we've done that. A lot of challenges still in the, in the AFL because it's just, uh, you know, the, the, the competition and pressure around the AFL is intense. So sponsorships are hard to come by, members are hard to come by. Uh, so that's difficult. But anyway, we're going OK with that. Um, so then we turned our attention to the football department last year, as you know, and took the hard decision of changing the coach. Um, and then have rebuilt our footy department. As, as again, you, I'm sure you're aware, with uh, lots of great people, including Neil Craig and Mark Neal and Dave Misson, the high performance coach. And then that really takes us into the playing list and on field performance. So that's really our focus at the moment. And um, I still got we're improving all the time. But look, AFL footy says you've got to turn over a minimum three players each year. You know, we'll probably turn over a few more than that this year. But um, yeah, continue to improve the list, let the, let the new footy department settle down, and hopefully the on field performance will improve in the next few weeks. You speak of the footy department. How much day-to-day -day contact do you have with the football department and, in, uh, and specifically Mark Neald? I'd probably speak to Mark once a week. He'll always, um, at least once a week, he would always ring me about what he's thinking for the weekend and changes and stuff like that. And look, he does that as much as he knows I'm a bit of a fanatical demon myself, so I'd like to know what's going on. Um, but I was really pleased last week when he made some changes, like you know he was thinking about putting Garland forward and using Maloney higher up and all sorts. He had great ideas, which I thought was fantastic. Cause, um, and he relays them to you. Yeah, he said, well, he tells you, he doesn't tell me exactly what he's doing, he tells what he's thinking, you know, yeah. and, uh, and my only feedback, for instance, last week was that um, a fool is someone who keeps doing the same thing and expecting a different result, so I said, keep, great, they sound like good moves and keep thinking innovatively and, and um, yeah, so he's, uh, yeah, so we keep in touch regularly, but uh, certainly I don't get involved in, he doesn't seek my advice, put it that way, um, <laughs> but he likes to keep me informed. Yeah, it's been said that he's uh, obsessed with establishing a high performance culture, how long does it take to build a culture like this and how much progress have you, do you think you've made since round one? Uh, that's a good question. We are, uh, the whole club is obsessed with this high performance culture. We, we just think we need to take a really big step um, forward across the whole club in that, and, uh, but particularly in our football department and our, and our, and our playing list. And it's being, it's being strongly driven by everybody in there. Um, how long does it take? I, I would say, to be honest, to get to the levels we think we need to get to, that might take another another pre-season and another season um, to get there to be able to maintain that high performance level. So it's a long-term project, but we're seeing the, you know, the results already, and a lot of guys have really improved in, in high performance areas you know, already. So uh, we're seeing the benefits of that. And why is Mark Neal the right man to take the club forward then? Uh, another tricky question, but look, a, a range of different things. One, um, I think he's a very good all-round sort of person, so he's highly competitive. Um, but he can cope with pressure, as I think we've already demonstrated. I think he's, he's, he's almost born to be a coach. He's got that kind of personality where um, he's got an all-round um, sort of view of the world. He's, he can be hard and tough, but he's, he's got a sense of humour. I think players respond to him, and I think he's got a, he's got a game plan in his head. Um, he knows how the game is going. Probably more importantly, I think he sees where the game is going, so I think he's building for that. Um, so, yeah, I think he's, he's a, the, the only issue we had when we were selecting Mark was about that experience of AFL coaching, and you know what a pressure cooker it is. Um, so that's why we felt the appointment of Neil Craig was really important, just to have that someone over the top of him who's had that experience, and also that we want him to coach the team, and the demands on an AFL coach are huge these days. So to be able to use Neil Craig in some areas and, and rather than Mark, we felt was a really good step for us. So look, we're very confident about Mark. I think he's going to be a great coach. Uh, what do you enjoy most about being president of an AFL club? Um, well, look, there's lots of great things. I like, like, obviously, we haven't won a game until last weekend, so, so uh, that was highly exciting and really obviously and we saw you embrace that. Colin Garland when he came in the room that yeah yeah well, Colin, well Colin's a you know he's a look we, we get on really well with the players our boards tried to get to close to the players without 
Um, we're not there to tell them how to play football, but we can support them um, in their life, what they're doing, where they might want to go, and we want to have a rapport with them that uh, they know we're behind them. So we have player and board dinners once a year all the time. So, so we're pretty close to that. So we get a lot of it's, it's it's still a footy club, you know. It's not unlike your local footy club. You get the same enjoyment out of uh, wins, losses, and the camaraderie that goes around the club, um, just as you would if you're going to a suburban footy club. So I like all that part of it. Yeah. As president of an AFL club. Um, what do you make of other presidents making comments on other clubs like coaches and that sort of stuff that we've seen recently? Yeah, I, I think it's, it is tricky where some of the presidents are in the media. So that always gives you a bit of a conflict straight away that they have to manage. And I think in general they manage it pretty well. But look, we don't, you know, we don't like being commented on by other clubs, and, and I'm sure vice versa. You know, so um, everyone tries to keep their head down a bit. But it is, I think, we do have to be realistic, and it's hard for those media commentators who are presidents as well to really stay out of that. I, I think that everyone understands it can be tricky. Yeah. Okay. Well, now it's time for 40 seconds with Don McClarty. In one word, describe the following people if you can, Don. Jack Grimes. Oh, leader. Uh, Jack Watts. Um. Potential. Uh, Cameron Schwab. He'll hate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cameron Schwab, I would say professional. Mm. Uh, Liam Jarrah. Excitement. Mark Neild. Um, st strategist. Uh, Neil Craig. Statesman. Andrew Dimitriou. Uh, top administrator. That's a few more than one word. two words. <laughs> Can I put one together? Yeah, Whatever. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to say administrator. It's no, a bit, top uh, administrator, yeah, yep. But, but really strong administrator. Yep. yep. Uh, Lee Brown. Uh, um, Lee Brown. Up and comer. That's three yep. words. Well, but yeah, That's I mean, fine. Like a, yep. David Neitz. David Neitz. Legend. Colin Sylvia. Um, Colin Sylvia. I want to say potential again, but I can't. No, you can say the same word yeah, twice say if you want. Potential, say, yeah. but, but, but he's too old to have potential now. Yeah. He's got to realise potential. That's yeah. the uh, Mark Sheen. Um, experienced. Mm -hmm. Chris Connolly. <laughs> uh, live wire. Tom Scully. Uh, that's a very hard one. <laughs> one word for Tom Scully. Good luck. That's two yeah. words again. Let's that's right, I can hyphenate it. That's okay. Good luck. Uh, Gary Lyon. Uh, legend as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, Don, thanks very much for joining us on Bound for Glory and good luck for the rest of the season. Good on you. Thanks very much, mate. Sensational interview with Melbourne President Don McClarty there. Boys, what do you think of that? I thought it was pretty good. Good insight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hold on. As a Melbourne supporter, what, what do you take out of that? <clears throat> well, obviously he's up and about considering Melbourne won their first game of the season last week. But um... Don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't rubbed it in yet, unfortunately. So we have to acknowledge the, uh, the the exceptional work of Tom Morris, uh, yeah. new addition to Absolutely. the to the team, uh, along with it's um, a huge scalp, Sophie Tom McClarty. Yeah, that was, and great work, great interview. It was very hard hitting. Enjoyed it. It was, especially the uh, the Tom Scully part that was uh, that was quite entertaining. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't into my seat as to what he was going to say. <laughs> and on that note, I think we should go to some sim messages. Sim messages. We'll be back right after this. This is an FYI for in joke, so it's okay if you don't get it. Did you have an absolute hoot at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival and go and see all of your favourite comedians and some you've never heard of before? Or maybe you missed out and are sad that because the festival has ended, there will not be comedy again in Melbourne until next year. Well, you're wrong. Every time I click my fingers, a local comedian gets a job in retail so they can eat. As more comedy venues close due to lack of popularity, comedians have to walk kilometres and kilometres from their house to the tram stop to their venue just to get fresh laughs. Did you know that there are comedy rooms running in Melbourne every day of the week? When you mistakenly think comedy is just for the comedy festival like a puppy is only for Christmas, another comedy room dies from laughter starvation. Do you want to be a better person and get more information? Listen to In Joke from 5pm Sundays for all of your comedy needs and for Melbourne comedy's sake. And we're back on Sin and now I think we're going to take a look. Ethan's going to help us take a look at what's going to happen. Forecast forward, what's the rest of the season going to look like? Well, we had Carlton Geelong last night. Many people were discussing that as an elimination final of sorts where... Many people expected the winner would go 7-4 and four and they'd look like they'd book a spot in the top eight almost. So I decided to have a look at the fixture, not just for the top eight, but, but for every single team. And it was quite interesting. I actually didn't have that down as an elimination final. I've 
by Geelong ended up um, sixth. But um, it was just interesting comparing the draws that um, every team's got for the rest of the year. I decided to rank every game as a win, a probable, or a loss. So you got Adelaide have the best run home uh, by the looks of things. They've got nine games that you'd expect them to win and three games in Port Adelaide because I don't, I can't write Port Adelaide off in um, the showdown. West Coast at home and Geelong at Simmons Stadium. They're the three games that they could potentially lose. I can't see them losing any of the others they've got. Collingwood have got seven wins and five probables. Uh, same with West Coast. Sydney have the same, except I've booked a loss against Collingwood at home for them because I, I don't think... They, they just seem to have trouble playing Collingwood at home. I can't win that game. That was that, like no. <laughs> 13 years or something without a win against Collingwood in Sydney? Uh, I got Hawthorne in fifth. They've got a... Uh, they've got no K draw. They've got a lot of... 50-50 games that they'll need to step up and win, starting with Port Adelaide this weekend, which I reckon is a real danger game for them. Geelong in sixth. Uh, they've got two games I've put down as as um, losses, which um, West Coast away and Sydney away. Essendon in seventh. They've got an extremely tough run home. They've got I've got eight games where they could potentially... That's 50-50 again. Three games which they probably should win uh, in the Doggies, Port Adelaide and North. And one one loss they should have. Uh, and then Richmond sneaking to eighth. So Carlton, St Kilda, Frio, just bordering on the eight. I got Carlton finishing 12 and 10 and out of the eight. That shows how tough it is to make it into the eight with an eight-team uh, team competition. Then we got teams North, Port, Brisbane, Doggies, Melbourne, Gold Coast, Greater West Sydney finish off the ladder. What do you guys think with the runs home? What do you, how do you think the final eight will shape? I'm just looking at this um, at this graph that you've provided us with, which is yeah, exceptional sp- work. Yeah, sp- spreadsheet of this all up. <laughs> um, so you're saying that you think, you, sorry, you expect the Gold Coast to go the entire season without winning a game? Uh, no, I, what I did is um, with the 50-50 games, I plotted um, their best probable finish, which yep. um, Gold Coast yep. got three of them in mm-hmm. um, North at home, Brisbane at home, and Greater Western Sydney at home. And then their worst finish, which is if they lose all those 50-50 games. So right, I, I, ex- okay. I expect them to win two. Th- in um, Brisbane and Greater Western Sydney. I think the greatest variable there, and I think one that will probably tell the story the rest of the season, is Essendon. That could be either, yeah. at best, 19-3, or at worst, 11-11. And, and, and missing the finals. Mm. Essendon are notorious for se- second half of the year fade-outs. They haven't won a game in June since 2009. Ridiculous stat. It's mm. a terrible stat. They can rectify that tonight, but they seem to spend all their petrol tickets at the start of the year, and, you know, they can't expect to be a top four team if that's going to happen. I think that they are starting to prove themselves. They've proved everyone wrong, which is good on them. They've kept all expectation internal, which has probably helped. But players have taken leaps, and the thing is, can they sustain it? Um, I mean, look, I think the players are getting a bit ahead of themselves. Zarakis was interviewed after the game, and I think he expected the game to be won. There's unconfirmed reports that there was a sponsor's night, and some of the players were expecting to go in and win. And even with Sam Lonigan starting off as a substitute, probably their best in an under-wet-weather player outside of Joe Watson, smacked of a bit of arrogance from the Essen Football Club. So I think it's, it was a good reality check. Happened last year, and Essen went downhill from there, and I guess it's up to the coaching staff to make sure that isn't repeated this year. And today, tonight's game will um, pose a significant variable in how they end up going. I think it was, uh, was it Melbourne last year that um, got their season unravelled? I think it was again. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Melbourne, uh, yep, I think Melbourne have <laughs> Essendon's number. And, it, and it's absolutely fantastic as well. But um, <laughs> Hawthorne is along in fifth and sixth. What do you guys make of that? Considering Hawthorne are probably the most bipolar team in the league, mm. I'd say that's probably spot on. I mean, I gave them, I ranked them a B for their season so far. You know, their losses against Richmond and Sydney say more than their wins. I mean, they essentially played against 21 blue and white, which is, hat, which is Hats last week. They could have just let Franklin do it all and he would have be, actually beat North Melbourne by, like, 20 points or something by himself. <laughs> if their probably best player is their most inconsistent, he kicks straight. Hawthorne, well, most likely they can push top four. If he doesn't, then they could be potentially bottom end of the eight. So I suppose we can pose the the all-consuming question, who are the Premiership favourites at halfway? I think you have to go with Collingwood. Collingwood. I'm going Collingwood. Mm, Collingwood, yeah. Adelaide. I think think with the um, grand final at the MCG, I think you've got to put them in as favourites. But um, what do you guys make of Richmond? I got them in eighth, which is one one spot higher than they normally finish. But um, (laughs) 
They, got, oh, they, got, they, yeah, have, they have a very easy run home. I just love watching Richmond play because everyone gets involved. Mm. And it's just... Like, you can't stay neutral watching Richmond. Yeah. No, because w- when it all goes right for Richmond, it all goes right. And it's just so much fun to watch. And, I mean, I hope they make the eight because, you know, it'd be good for them and they have... The, yep. You know, they've made the same amount of finals as Fitzroy, who no longer exists in the last, like, since the 80s. But, um, yeah, I'd love, to, love, them, love them to make the finals just for the spectacle of it. And they've, uh, they've just recently signed up their 50,000th member. Good which on is, them. Congratulations. Uh, good for Tigers. Named Tigers. Dustin yeah, Tiger yeah. something. Oh, yes. Oh, the, oh, the, the, the article was... in the paper of um, the, uh, a couple who oh. named their child Dustin Martin. Complete so face No, they, 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 they called him Jake du- King. <laughs> you, know, you know, Dustin, middle name Martin, last name the surname. Uh, I think his uh, middle name was wasn't Tiger, King. wasn't it? No, it was Dustin, middle name Martin. <laughs> yeah. yeah, middle name Martin. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think they've only got one definite loss for the, se- the rest of the season. That's Adelaide away. But um, I think Prolub, you've got a segment now, I believe. Uh, I think we can move on from that. Yeah. Which is probably a counterpoint to what this season is. Plen- plenty of people are saying, you know, oh, it's even, but... Is it really even pull up? What have you come up with? Yeah, I think right now the AFL is relatively even, but there are some issues being faced in the future. So what I'm going to discuss right now is, I guess, why creating competitive competition is really important for the AFL. So that's basically where everything is a level playing field, and this is a good example of that, where basically there's no clear premiership favourites outside of probably Gold Coast, Greater Western Sydney and Melbourne. Pretty much every team can potentially make the eight. That's probably a bit nice on North and, I guess, the Western Bulldogs there. But it's really important for a few reasons. First of all, for the fans, because it's really important to be able to maintain the interest levels. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why Richmond supporters are going, because there's always this interest that at some point it will all click, and it seems to have clicked this year. But there's also some, I guess, evidence to back that up. Ross Booth, who's a lecturer at Monash University and also wrote a few theses, and I think he works with the ABC as well, wrote a couple of articles on this, and what he basically looked at is when one team dominates the league, how it leads to lower interest levels and attendances in that league. So he looked at the Yankees, for, for example, in the US, and closer to the home with the Brisbane Lions winning three premierships in a row, the interest levels in the AFL actually waned where a few teams were simply there at the top of the league. And there's been a lot of studies shown where you link the competitiveness, basically. If a league is competitive people start to watch it more. And the only league that defies the trend around the world is pretty much the English Premier League. For some reason, people keep watching, despite probably about five or six teams probably being able to win it. That's why. They are. And I guess the AFL needs to make sure it remains competitive because ultimately, if interest levels increase, that's where more money comes into the game. You can do a lot more with it. I mean, this broadcast deal was on the back of record high attendances, record high television viewings, and they have to make sure that occurs. What does the AFL currently do? Firstly, it looks at the draft system. I think secondly, there's a salary cap in place. And thirdly, there's some sort of equalisation funds to allow poorer clubs to actually compete with the richer clubs. But there are a few issues which are going to be faced in the future. First of all, coming up with free agency. So every team has a salary cap in the current situation. And the main differentiating factor between the clubs is, I guess, their facilities, the standard of coaching staff, how much money they spend, and I guess post-football opportunities. That's where clubs such as Collingwood, West Coast, have a distinct advantage where they can often poach players from other clubs simply on the back of their actual sustained success. So that's something a major issue that the AFL is currently facing. And I guess if you look at football spending, well, Collingwood... Sorry to interrupt, yeah, that's the go. example for the Premier League. Exactly, all the best that's players right. in the world go to the top four clubs in, in England. Exactly the, right. Both the Manchesters, um, Liverpool and Arsenal. Yeah, so the, the lower teams tend to develop these players and then the top teams simply pick him up when they've been developed and use them for their own Premiership success. I mean, if you look at football spending, Collingwood spent something like $19 million on football spending last year. I think Richmond was 15 North and Port were significantly lower. And a lot of these, I think Port at one stage had, what, Dean Laidley as a, appearing by Skype? Yeah, something during, along those during, lines? During the week, they'd have him um, speak to play. He'd be uh, over in Melbourne and he'd just have him in a room with players with just some stats and analytical sort of things. He's a different unit, though, Dean. <laughs> exactly he's, he's right. A he's a special man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, everyone has access to a draft system. I guess everyone has access to that same talent pool, but it's how you develop that talent pool that really differentiates a team in building that premiership success. So the AFL needs to do a few things. I guess, first of all, they need to make sure there is a hard cap for the salary cap, and I think they are moving towards that. I mean, we all saw with Chris Judd, basically, you know, there was a... The AFL ticked off the, the environmental ambassadorship, which allowed Carlton to effectively take him and pay him outside the salary cap, and they've been a bit more... I guess, circumstance with that, with, I guess, Tom Scully 
situation going ahead. And I think the AFL needs to be a lot more clearer in making sure they look at into things such as post-football payments. So, I mean, someone like Adele Thomas or other Collingwood players may accept less money at Collingwood because they know they'll be looked after after they actually finish up retiring. And I think that's something that the AFL do need to look at and making sure that clubs aren't unofficially paying, paying players after the fact. Not that I'm suggesting Collingwood's doing that, but I think a lot of the richer clubs, players stay on at those clubs because they know they will be looked after after the, after the fact. And I guess the second thing, they need a draft system in place. The priority pick, I know it's often much maligned here, but I think it's really important to make sure that the lower teams get an opportunity to access the best talented players. So I think that's something that probably needs to stay in place. They can probably look at tinkering with it a bit. That's something that they do need to do. And I guess the most important thing is also the equalisation fund. So with the broadcast agreement, a lot of the poorer clubs or clubs who don't have access to primetime television time spots do receive money. So I think North Melbourne's one example of that. And it's really important that the AFL looks at specific targeted funding. So, for example, into coaching staff, into development staff, rather than sort of generic financial amounts of money. And I guess finally, the fixture to me is one major issue. So to me, it has a flow and effect in the long term. So if you look at, for example, North Melbourne, back in the glory days where they pioneered Friday night football, they were a relatively large club. But over time, the big clubs tend to play each other in primetime slots, and that lack of exposure leads to a drop in attendances, leads to this widening gap between the poor and rich, and that's something the AFL have to address. They need a proper fixture in place where everyone gets access to proper primetime slots and gets enough exposure out there in the AFL. And I guess making sure the entire environment is competitive is fundamentally important for the AFL. It's one of the biggest challenges facing the AFL right now. Uh, yeah, just on that, um, yeah, because of that sort of fixturing, the AFL do give money to North Melbourne, the Bulldogs and St Kilda because they actually don't play any, in any blockbusters. Um, and you're, you're also right with those third-party agreements. Uh, you know, there were rumours flying about that yeah, Chris Newman, uh, Brendan Gale, Andrew Demetrio all went to Jeep and some lawyers. So And Richmond were, at the end of last year, had some salary cap issues. So you'd suggest that something's going down there. Well, Along they, those they lines, cracked down on it with Tom Scully, though. Yeah, mm. they have cracked down on it. Um, but, you know, again, it's it's not illegal. You'd say about 80 players have that. I mean, Dangerfield got a new car mm, yeah. Yeah. when he yep. signed on, posted on Twitter. Um, there are all the rumours about Chris Judd with Vizzy at, um, at Carlton yeah, as well. The, the unfair ones with Judd is it just he's been such a great player and of course he's going to get the spotlight if yeah. it's, it's something for opposition supporters to go oh look at Judd they're paying and that's how it works I mean you'll see the Western because of the mining boom Fremantle are going to at the end of the year probably make a big offer at either Cloak or Goddard so don't be surprised if they are you know pushed for space they say here we'll give you a speaking job mm, like you know, incentives, one of these yeah. companies outside yeah. incentives yeah yeah, and I guess it's even incentives towards their family. So if they're moving up with their partner, they can often try to find work for their partner, and that's sort of an added sort of benefit that some of the larger clubs have. So it's what the AFL needs to look at a bit more, a bit more harder, I guess, these days. It's an interesting, it's a confusing issue, and it's you know, something the AFL have spent time on trying to fix, and they'll continue in the future to keep doing it. We're going to text in your thoughts <coughs> on that, by the way. 0427 767 767. Just while he dies of a coughing yeah, attack in the corner. Oh. You sick. Uh, no, no, just something got caught in my throat just now, so <laughs> sorry about that. Joking, everyone. sorry. Yeah, I think oh. I, I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think on that note we should go to a break. Saints, are we? <laughs> So my name's Josh. I run a dubstep and electro show on Monday night. You should probably listen in uh, Mondays 8 till 10 p.m. It's fun stuff. We have regular guests, new music all the time, and we're going to be talking to the latest, greatest in dubstep, electro, and now drum and bass. Tune in to Sins in the Electro Night from 8 to 10. Film. Literature. Theatre. Interpretive dance. Installation art. Ballet. Opera. Visual art. Origami. Cabaret. Beat poetry. Street art. Mime. Puppetry. Burlesque. Baroque. Arts Venue, Sin's Youth Sunday Arts Program. 4 p.m. Sundays on Sin. Get cereal! Slept in this week? This is what you missed. I was just offended. They didn't even ask me to be. <laughs> How about yourself, Esther? Are you a vegetarian? I'm not a vegetarian, but I, I can't eat lamb. That technically makes Sally the sexiest vegetarian in the room. Yeah, yeah. So congratulations, well, Sally. Yay. We're back on Aaron. Oh, we're back on Get Cereal with Aaron, Mark, and Rachel. Um, were you about to introduce yourself as being on Aaron? <laughs> it was awkward. Just go past it. Go past it. <laughs> Get Cereal. Get Cereal. Get 
material from 6am weekdays only on Sin. And we're back and you're listening to Bound for Glory on Sin. We have an interview queued up with ex-Collingwood rookie, now playing at Werribee, Jai Bolton. Pete went down to him, one of our producers went down there last Saturday to speak to him, and here it is. Obviously coming from Leopold, you were out in the Geelong districts, were you expecting to sort of be drafted or? Um, oh, not during the year, but um, as after I went to that Nick Maxwell leading Lopez camp and started to um, look more likely, so um, I was just on the development list at Falcons and um, I was just hoping to try and get a gig there, and so to get drafted in the end was, you know, I was absolutely over the moon, but now that's ended, I've got to try and do it again. So. Yeah. Did you find, like, Nick Maxwell, how much did he have an involvement on you as such? Like, was it something that he actually sort of helped you in a way, or did he help you sort of get drafted? Did he sort of have a word? Do you know how much influence he had? Yeah, yeah, he would have had a, um, well, he was a bloke who pretty much pushed for me in the end and got my name sort of put up there most um, others for a chance. And, um, yeah, he was a really good mentor for me throughout the whole year, and, um, yeah, pretty much him and uh, Aaron Greaves, who's a coach at... Um, Melbourne now, who's followed me from, he was at my coach at Leopold, then would have been at Falcons and now he's at Melbourne. Um, he really assisted in that happening too. So. And uh, you got a call from Eddie Maguire, did you? Just I did, yeah. Some stage? Oh, well, pretty much as soon as I got drafted, he just said, yeah, welcome to the club. But yeah, so that was pretty. Yeah, that was strong. pretty different for yeah. someone down that way. Um, and you obviously got to play in the NAB Cup, yeah. um, and you kicked a couple of goals in that round robin thing. Um, yeah. How do you feel your form was going into the season? Oh yeah, well I had a full pre season and all that, so I was pretty, I was pretty happy with how I was, um, how I was travelling at that stage, and I was just trying to um, better myself as a player, not necessarily looking to play NAB Cup. That was a good bonus, but um, yeah, in the end, I was um, pretty happy with how I went and. Um, didn't really continue as well as I was hoping into the VFL season, but uh, yeah, I was pretty happy with how it went early on. And and did you feel that you were going to get a game at all during the season, or oh, as, a, as a rookie listed vote, not, not particularly, but um, yeah, I've, I uh, at times you, you you hope that you would, but I, my form probably didn't. Um, allow that to happen so yeah and do you see the difference between AFL and VFL in terms of standards or oh, I didn't really I didn't play AFL but <laughs> no, Cup, like, yeah, it, was, it was a massive step up straight away so um, yeah it, there's, there's a fair difference like there's um, VFL still got some really talented players but obviously it goes up once again with um, strength and uh, speed and knowledge that other players have in the in the higher levels that um, yeah it really makes it a lot a lot tougher. And, and did you find that um, towards the end of the season that you were sort of getting a little concerned? Were you, or did you think you were going to make it through the next season, or what was? I was uh, I was fairly confident, but you never know what they what um, with a new coach coming in and um, that sort of thing. You never know where they're going to go with. Um, with selecting their new list and whether I'm going to was going to be kept on or, or delisted, and of course I was I was trying to go in there as positive, or try and stay as positive as I could, and uh, in the end didn't work, didn't form my way. But I was lucky to end up there, and maybe unlucky to leave. But um, yeah, I was I was obviously I'm very disappointed. I'm trying to look as hard as I can to get on another list somewhere. And have was it mainly because of the midfield sort of depth that Collingwood have? Was that the main reason that they sort of had to? Um, or Look, I'm sure that would have been a factor in it, but they, they would have weighed up many, many areas of my game to see whether it was going to benefit the, the team going forward. And probably they thought that um, with the list they had, I didn't quite fit into that. So um, I was a bit unlucky, but yeah. And did, did, have you, did you get much of a chat to any other clubs over the off-season? Yeah, I got to chat to a few. Um, personally, I um, tried to contact a couple myself because obviously I'm, I was pretty keen to get back onto a list. So... Um, yeah, I, I talked to a, a few clubs and did a couple of sessions down at um, down at Geelong, and, but uh, didn't. Yeah, again, you never know where how the draft's going to go, and um, yeah, so I was pretty upset that do I didn't. You, do you know how close you got? Like, did they? Say I don't really know how. They close didn't really got, nah. say anything about we might draft you if you. I, I don't there, know. No? Like, it it might have just been the way that how they thought they were going to select, and in the end, maybe some players that they thought wouldn't have come through that pick lasted or. You never know. Like I, I, I don't know what's going on inside the, inside the clubs and who they're looking for and whatsoever. So, but I just got to keep trying to put my best foot forward. And, and how's life down here at Werribee now? Yeah, love it. All the boys are great lads. So um, it's pretty prof- it's pretty professional environment still. Um, not a, obviously quite up to the full time because we only have the three sessions a week. Yep. But when we're when we're here, all the boys are uh, here to do their job and 
um, yeah, we all try and get the best of ourselves. And obviously catching up with some guys this match, because you yeah, know yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, a few, so. a few of them, a few coaches, a couple who had chat to Tarks and that before the game. So, um, yeah, it was, it's, it's sort of a weird feeling um, not being able to, uh, or being on the opposite side of them. So, um, but yeah, it, yeah, it's good to, good to see a few of the lads. Great interview there with uh, Jai Bolton. Thanks for that, Pete. Um, he was pretty much removed from the list. Change of coach. Do you, Pete, you're obviously a Collingwood supporter. Do you think he'll be picked up again by another club? Well, he was good enough. Um, he kicked a couple of goals in the round robin when we played Carlton and Richmond in that NAB Cup thing, and I thought he was the best first-year player on that NAB Cup form, and that includes, like, Fazzolo, who obviously went brilliantly during the year, but, yeah, on NAB Cup form, he was actually better. So, What about during the year, VFL form? Well, he seemed to be reasonably up there. Like, he was getting over 20 disposals a game. Like, he got injured, I think, in the middle and had a few weak games towards the end, but he certainly was not our worst. There were a few senior list players that were a lot worse. Such as? Oh, just a few that we may have got. Um, <laughs> I, think, that are... I think we should move on. We'd some previews. <laughs> we could get into some big trouble there. Um, round 11 continues today at the MCG. Richmond take on the Fremantle Dockers. The Tigers, the last two games, have played uh, brilliant football. Intensity is up. Dockers are slowly drowning in their own flood. Where do you guys see this one going? I think it's a game based on how many goals Richmond can kick because I don't think Freo will kick over 10. Uh, you, look, you look at the forward line, Rewalt on Dawson. <laughs> oh, he's going to kick a bag today. He's going to be fun. Uh, Vickery on McFarlane. You'd, you'd think McFarlane would take Rewalt, who is in really seriously good form at the moment. Um, at the other end, you got Rance on Pavlich, which we discussed during the break. That looks like a brilliant matchup. But I, th- I think Richmond are just going to run away with this one. Frio's form at the MCG is deplorable. Uh, what do you think, Prilab? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how Richmond cope with a different style of football because Ross Lyon will bring a different set of skills, and I think Richmond. it'll be interesting to see how Richmond go. So for me, I think Fremantle will probably end up winning because I don't think Richmond are at this stage able to play a slightly different brand of football yet. But I think Freo will win in a close one with a few goals kicked only. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. Another interesting matchup. You've got Morris on Lockie Neal, two really, really talented young footballers, which you know should be interesting. Morris absolutely smothered Rioli two weeks ago. Uh, he played on you know, a mixture of Milne, Sard, and he you know in a far, high scoring game he did pretty well. I think Richmond, just because it, it seems like the weather's not going to hold off, it's going to probably bucket down later. So I reckon Tigers by about two or three goals. Uh, I will go with the Tigers because um, Frio don't know how to win outside of Western Australia. Um, yeah, that look. I mean, their midfield is formidable at this stage. I've been spouting my, my crap all week, but I think um, it's the, the junior version of um, Cox, Judd, Cousins. Kerr and Cousins. Um, mm. I agree not with many, that. Not many people agree with me. I don't but, think I disagree with you. Um, but yeah, uh, Cochin, I love. I love him so much. Uh, he's just a fantastic footballer. I think he'll win a Brownlow one day, and I'm going to have to go with Richmond on this one. Yeah, it's Play better be, footy in the wet as well, sorry. It's going to be uh, interesting to see how Frio can actually score a, a decent uh, scoreline this week, um, although they did well against Adelaide. Um, but in saying that, uh, I reckon, uh, yeah, the, the Tigers have been uh, in decent form. Um, yeah, Cochin, again, awesome player. I reckon he's... Uh, He's up there in the uh, the Brownlow votes. Um, he's, he's one of my, my picks, actually. Um, but, yeah, I reckon uh, the, the Tigers, Tigers will win. I'm going to go with the Tigers by five goals plus. Um, our second favourite man with the mullet, Ivan Marich, behind Cal Morton uh, versus Aaron <laughs> Sandilands in the ruck. That'll be very interesting. But I think we've got to move on to Gold Coast St Kilda, and I don't think Gold Coast will improve no, no, their run at St Kilda Metricum. by a fair bit. Yep. Yeah, uh, you know, it's hard to tip Ablett against the Saints. Um, yeah, I think the Saints. <laughs> um, Carmichael Hunt names in the centre is very interesting. Against Lenny Hayes against will be a Lenny learning Hayes. experience. Yeah. That'll be very good to see. But um, Not a whole lot interesting about this one. I'll but say. Gold Coast have not won at Metricon Stadium. I think that's just a... Why build a stadium if you're not going to win at it? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a huge stat when you look at it. Um, St Kilda by, I think, 50-plus points you have to go with. Yeah, how far are the Saints? Yeah, pretty much. Saints by about four or five kicks. Yep, Saints as well. I think Gold Coast seem to be slightly less athlete conscious, though. Yep, uh, Saints comfortably. Uh, tonight at Etihad Stadium, this is probably the Big match one. of the round. This is, is huge. The, the Bombers one. take on the Swans. 
I tell you what, Essendon last week, they walked out like millionaires and they came off looking like absolute bums. I agree um, there. You know, Kent, That's brilliant. Do you think there's anything to worry about it? Because, you know, once you sort of get into a certain mindset, it, it's hard to get out of it again. No, it was a Brad Scott word of the week, aberration. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, folks, two aberrations is a trend. Um, uh, it's hard to go past Essendon considering the Swans are absolutely awful in Victoria. It's awful at the MCG. They're actually awful. all right at Etihad. Not, not against Therefore. Essendon. I mean, last year, goods missed after the siren. The last, the last few games with last, Essendon Sydney have all been, what, less than 10 points? Yeah, last mm. four have been by less than 10 points. Yep. So this is going to be absolute cracker. Uh, the Swans aren't playing as defensive as you think. They're missing some X Factor and some pace. You know, they're going to be missing Luke Parker. Who did his shoulder last week? He missed six Very weeks. Unfortunate. Very mm. unfortunate. Very unfortunate. He's an absolute gun. Um, I personally just think that the Dons by a kick, it's going to be an absolute great game. I like that matchup in the middle of the two Brownlow favourites head to head, Watson and Kennedy. That's, cool. that's going to be fantastic. Yeah, that's huge. Um, personally, uh, I am going to tip, oh, jeez, probably Essendon. Um, I think last week was. As I said, just an aberration, and uh, I think they can bounce back. Um, they have brought back in Heppel, Hooker, and who's the other one they brought in? Fletcher. Yes. Fletcher. No, Myers. 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 Apologies. Yes. So, so my- yeah, a little bit of a uh, little bit of help for their defence coming back in there for the chip scab Heppel. Yeah, I reckon the the, the, the Dons will win. Um, although it's going to be a very close encounter, I wouldn't be surprised if the uh, the Swans actually get up. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've also got a, um, a text here um, from Strawnside. He says, uh, able to get more touches than the Gold Coast score again? Just a question. <laughs> I'm sure there's a betting <laughs> market. There's got to be a betting market out there for that. If not, then the It'd be about be. $3. Yeah. Yeah, get on it, folks. Gamble responsibly. Yeah, it's a heavy sports bet. Yeah. Jamie Rogers. Yes. We love Jamie Rogers. Come on the show, Jamie. Hello, love Jamie Rogers love here. Love okay, 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 lads. Let's get on, let's with, get get on with it. Let's get on with it. Port take on we the We didn't Hawks. do our tips. Oh, we didn't do our tips. Gee, sorry. Oh, sorry, fellas. Um, I'm going to go with Essendon. I think no goods will be the big factor, and Jake Melchin from Essendon needs to be put on notice at the moment. Last night I tipped Essendon. I'm going to go with a draw. Can we? Can we start? He's a probably new, right. Can we start a new segment called Prolabs Pressure Cooker, where he puts an Essendon player? I on should do that. <laughs> I, I, Jace, I, I, I tipped Kate Simpson's post from the last quarter. Yet yeah, last night, I think that was pretty good. I so see him on a roll. Jake, I'll make it two in a row. Jordan Knight. Jake Melksham, Jake Melksham is in the pro, is in pro He pressure is in the pro, I mean, plenty of players have gone out. Uh, Coiler, you know, Heppel's inhibits meant to come in soon. And I guess Remus dominating the seconds. So he needs to start acting on his potential. Otherwise, he might find himself in the twos. But I guess moving on to the next game, Port Adelaide versus Hawthorne tomorrow at Amy Stadium. Port would have to be a good chance, but I think it's up there in Adelaide. Absolutely. I think this is Hawthorne's danger game. Considering they're the most bipolar team in the league, as I said before, you know, they could come out, come out tomorrow and if the power of excuse the pun, switched on. <laughs> then, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, every chance in the world Port can, you know, come up with an upset here. Um, yeah, as you said, Hawthorne, very bipolar. It depends on how um, Lance Franklin responds to his 13-goal <laughs> demolishing of North last week. Play on um, Carlisle and Chaplin, he'll find it tough. But um, I'm going to go with Port Adelaide. I think um, they've won four of the last five. I think they're just being up. difficult. You guys are all. You, what is wrong with you? It's got to be Hawthorne. It's Port. Come on. Can we say that when North? Play? Yeah, I know we did, but like, I'm. Yeah, I don't learn, so I'm going to go with the Hawks. Um, yeah. Too strong everywhere. Hawks by three goals. It was a bit of a bit of a power surge last week. Just running on with the puns. Hi all. <laughs> Against Carlton, Jesus but um, yeah, I reckon the Hawks. The Hawks will win this one. Yeah, Hawthorne as well. I think Buddy will kick more behinds than goals, though. And finally, the uh, Melbourne Collingwood game on Queen's birthday, which isn't actually her birthday at all. <laughs> the blockbuster match, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> Already sent a birthday present to her. It's a bit unfortunate. Yeah. What'd you get her? Um, not just flowers, just the usual. They'll probably die sending it over there, but... Uh, oh. Who, the Queen or the flowers? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, can we just can, can we just this do this preview? Ridiculous. Can we, we just have one minute left. We've got one minute. Um, yeah, I'm going finish. with Collingwood. Collingwood by four goals. Collingwood by plenty, plenty of goals. Ten yep. goals. Collingwood. Collingwood. Uh, I think that's all we have time for. If we're going to insult anyone else, can we just get out of the way now? No, no. Okay, let's just get on with it. I hate you, Joyce. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> our, whip, our whipping boy, our plugs. Get around Sarge Supercoach on Twitter. He's you know, sign up to his newsletter, all your Supercoach needs. Uh, Read the Bound for Glory news, a uh, great news service by some you know, you mean great... You the Big Footy news? Big Footy. No, uh, well, both. We're gonna well, get... yeah, of course. We They're both there. legitimate forms, yeah. but ours is... At Bound for Glory FM as well on Twitter. Yeah, follow us at, on Twitter. And, and Facebook. Twitter, Facebook. Facebook, all of the things. 
Yeah, and I think that's it for another huge show, and we're going to go out with our theme. Yep, catch you guys. See you next time. Later. <laughs>